Welcome everyone to George's fantastic tavern where Europe meets Asia. In today's session, I'm going to be discussing strong men and masculinities uh, with one of George's most interesting and celebrated young writers, playwrights, novelists, translators, David Gabunia. Um, David has a recent book called Novel, his first novel called Falling Apart. We're going to be talking about it today within the context of a, of a quote uh, from a film that, that, that many of you might know and love, as I do, Levin Akin's Cannes, Cannes Film Festival hit, And Then We Danced, about a, um, a, a gay traditional Georgian dancer who comes out uh, while in Georgia's national dance troupe. And at one point in that film, an instructor shouts, Georgian dance is based on masculinity. There's no room for weakness. So these are themes, David, that you explore um, in your book, Falling Apart. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about it, uh, uh, how the book began and, and what your intention was in writing it. Uh, hi, everyone. So, and thank you, Mike, for this introduction. So, as for my book, uh, as you mentioned, it's my first novel and I'm just writing the second one and it's taking quite a while. But uh, as for the first book, this novel falling apart, I've, it's very often it is um, compared to, uh, to Alfred Hitchcock's The, the Cult film, uh, The Rear Window, because yeah, I do exploit this. Um, uh, um, it's not a quote even, but it's a form, I would say, that, that someone is observing uh, uh, someone and taking pictures of, uh, in the block across. So, <clears throat> but um, apart from my big love to Alfred Hitchcock, I, I love to quote him very often and to do some reminiscences and allusions to his uh, famous films. Uh, I, I live in a quarter in Tbilisi, in a Soviet quarter uh, called Sabutalo, which is full of those blocks, 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 and blocks, and it's quite gray and dull. And they are called Khrushchevkas because the, most of them were built in Khrushchev times, in Soviet Union times, when Georgia was the part of the Soviet Union. So um, it's a, uh, how to say, an uh, urban uh, area with um, not much to enjoy apart from observing your neighbors. So I've been living there in one of those blocks for 13 years. And I had this experience of <clears throat> living there like a normal life and uh, noticing that there was a guy, a neighbor who was observing, clearly observing me for many, many years. And uh, I had this feeling and all my friends who would come to my place and we would drink their party or whatever, we would think, uh, uh, we would make some stories and jokes about this man, who he is, what he is doing, what kind of life he leads, and so on and so on. And he, to me, he was a gray, uh, an ordinary person. I mean, a person you can never distinguish or doesn't have any distinguishable or some specific signs that you can recognize him in the street. So I started fantasizing about this man and imagining his life what kind of life this man might have. And that's how the idea was born. And uh, besides, uh, <clears throat> I've been also engaged in activism in, uh, for women's rights a very long time and for LGBT rights. And uh, I always had this, uh, I would not call it an urge, but uh, a, some, some wish or big, big wish to write something about these issues. And, uh, but I did not want to have the inside perspective because um, in uh, queer literature, very often you meet the queer characters, queer central characters, their perspectives, their uh, thoughts and their uh, voices, so to say. And for me, strangely, uh, I don't know why, but I had this idea that I'm not interested in doing this. I'm mm. interested in the other perspective. Uh, over so that, that's... That's fascinating because um, I'm realizing that your protagonist is, is actually that gray man yes. <laughs> observing you rather than you observing him. And let's talk about that in a minute, uh, about perspective and, 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 and subjectivity in this novel. But, but before we do so, I, I was very struck by the way 
uh, you were describing the way your life in, in, in this Khrushchevia was being observed. Mm -hmm. um, your life, I, I assume, as a gay man. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested in that within the context of the Khrushchevia itself, as a remnant of the Soviet era, which was so much about um, state observation and control of the individual. And I'm wondering about what the context of that is in this novel, particularly given that the novel is set in the autumn of 2012, which was a time of great foment in Georgia. You said it very specifically at a time of great protests, at a, at, at a time when, when Georgians were really reevaluating their post-Soviet democracy and whether they had democracy or whether they were still being abused in ways reminiscent of the Soviet abuse. So perhaps you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. as for the context, uh, uh, the background, I would say, background of the novel, well, uh, those uh, political events are, uh, um, how to say, a smudged or not so very clear background for the main action in the novel. And I wanted, uh, I decided to set the action of the novel in uh, against this background because I wanted something turbulent from the uh, recent history, something that was really important, something that caused a big, um, so how to say, big, big uh, nervousness in the society. Uh, and I chose those 2012 events. And for those of you who don't know the context, it was uh, pre-election times in, in Georgia. And as you know, uh, elections are the times when the manipulation of, of uh, um, it reaches the peak, so to say. And that's what happened in Georgia. So they, they were the leaked uh, videos, so to say. Well, of course, they were not leaked. They were uh kept until those pre-election times and they were the, these were the videos of the abuse uh, and including rape tortures beating insulting of uh, male prisoners in georgian prisons and that caused a big uproar in the society and uh, everyone was out in the streets and protesting and this government must go and so on and so on well uh, this uh, had a big result uh, and there was a big shift uh, in the uh, government. So there was a new party that came to power. I would not say they, they are doing better, but anyway, <laughs> but this is not our issue now. I'm not- But your, 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 your protagonist, Zurab, in fact, spends a fair, a fair amount of time in the novel, I understand. Yeah. Forgive me, I haven't read the whole one because I don't read Georgian or, 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 or German, uh, viewing these videos. Um, and, 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 and I imagine uh, specifically viewing videos of, of, of emasculation, of, mm -hmm. of, of rape. I mean, the, the most horrific of those videos that got a lot of international attention yeah. was of male prisoners being raped with broomsticks, right? Well, that it's was, uh, yeah. The, the, um, well, the main thing for me in this novel is that this book is not about those events. Yeah. And I, I deliberately chose those very harsh and very important events in the society's life to show how uh, how the main character, how the protagonist does not really care. Uh, and uh, that all the, uh, all the action is uh, very, how to say, it's a chamber piece, so to say, mm. concentrated, really uh, very much concentrated on the inner life and or, or the personal private life of the characters. And while but, these things are happening, the uh, protagonist makes decision that uh, he has no decision, so to say. I mean, his decision is not to involve in anything, not to be involved, and just to follow his path, what he is doing in his private. Path. That 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 in and of itself is is a crisis of masculinity. Yeah. And it seems that your book is about uh, the crisis. The novel, the theme of the novel, is about the crisis of masculinity. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about yeah. that and well, and well, how he exemplifies the crisis of masculinity, mm -hmm. uh, both in his own life and 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 in terms of of what he's observing in, in the next building. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the main character is the married man uh, in his early thirties, unemployed, and which is quite unusual and not so typical for Georgia that he is unemployed and his wife is the breadwinner, so to say. She provides for the family and he in his turn takes care of, of uh, their children, which is not so typical. It's because uh, we, are, we are still quite a patriarchal society, I would say. And um, when I'm thinking about it, when I'm thinking why I wrote this book uh, about this man, the character, so I, I uh, quite late 
later, and not, I, I was not thinking about it during in the process of writing, but then a bit later I realized that actually all my writing is about the masculinity crisis, like not just the novel, but all the plays too, more or less. So, uh, you know, because there, there is this, uh, I need to give a context somehow to explain this. Uh, so what happened in Georgia in 90s and what is still happening is that uh, from a quite patriarchal society, we're painfully and slowly moving to more egalitarian, so to say, to, to more gender equality, uh, which means the uh, big emancipatory movement of women. So women came out and women are becoming more and more important and uh, holding more important positions and emancipating, so to say. So this is a very long process and still ongoing process. I don't, I'm not saying that we have achieved the equality, uh, but, um, and during this process, men uh, and the women's issues and the feminist um, activism is getting stronger. So everywhere you can hear nowadays on TV or wherever on social networks, so women's activism is quite um, visible. Uh, and, uh, but very often, um, almost all of them always talk about women, about the women's side, about the victims, the survivors, about uh, success stories of women and the problems of women. And very often we do neglect uh, that uh, the other side of the problem, uh, which is uh, actually it is a problem that men are struggling with their masculinities and trying to not, they are not even trying to reevaluate their masculinity and that uh, troubled masculinity is the problem actually. So that's why I thought um, maybe it's my niche, so to say, to, to write about the men, uh, about the men who are in crisis and who are not clever or intelligent enough to realize what is the problem actually. So here in this book, um, well, I tried to, to make it as simple as possible, a, a very simple language, and it was really hard to write that simple. Uh, and uh, to make it, to, to write a story uh, with the elements of thriller and crime, uh, not completely thriller, not completely that crime or psychological drama or whatever, but to make it and uh, to write a book that would be accessible for, for wide, wider audiences and to draw the main attention, their attention to the story, how the story is built and to have the uh, message uh, not so explicit there. So, uh, and to have it uh, somehow implied in, in the plot. So this is what happens when um, a man cannot um, realize or, or is not intelligent enough or is not willing to, to understand his own standing in the uh, current situation. And that leads to catastrophe. So he is closed, uh, unwilling to uh, reflect uh, upon everything, uh, upon himself and what is happening around him. And that, that what leads to the catastrophe in the book. So I don't, I don't want you to give away too much because yeah. I really hope this book is going to be published in English, hopefully as a result of this, um, of this wonderful festival, it will come to the attention of the right yeah. publisher. But, but can you tell us a little bit about what it is that, that Zurab, the gray man, if you like, mm -hmm. is seeing yeah. uh, so, through on, on the other, in the next building and, and, and what that triggers in him yeah. and what you are wanting to do by describing that, those triggers. Yeah, so to, to be very brief about it, so he, uh, when his life is completely full of boredom of doing nothing and the extreme heat in, in August uh, in Felicity, and it is really hot in Felicity in August. So uh, he just observes, uh, spends his days on uh, doing nothing, uh, smoking all the time. And he just notices that uh, across, uh, in the block across, a new neighbor moves in, uh, and this new neighbor is a much, much younger guy, uh, and he um, starts observing the, the life, the personal life, private life of this young uh, guy, and uh, very soon he finds out that the man is gay, uh, and that he's holding parties there, he's having some, some of his lovers, and uh, this causes and um, somehow a um, uh, ambivalent reaction in, in the main protagonist. So he is somehow drawn to this and uh, attracted by this fact, but 
he is uh, he's a homophobe, so he's quite harsh in his language and he says saying the f words and so on and so on all the time while watching this observing, but he, he cannot not see this all, all the time. So the and the main uh, intrigue of the book is based on uh, on one particular lover, which is an older man in his sixties and who looks like an official. And his secret visits because he always comes uh, like every second night, only uh, at late night to, to this young man, and they have this secret uh, affair. So this is what uh, Zurab uh, is becoming the witness of. And he starts taking pictures and documenting uh, everything carefully. And all his life uh, for more than a month, he's like completely obsessed with this. And uh, I don't want to, um, fall into the trap of, of, of following a cliche that every homophobe is gay. But, well, there is some truth in it. <laughs> anyway, in my experience, <laughs> there's more than a little is, truth yeah, in it. Yeah, that would be too stereotypical to, to <laughs> generalize. But uh, anyway, there, there is some truth in it. So, and there is this uh, somehow, he is attracted to those people, uh, to their lives, and at the time he somehow uh, his reaction is quite harsh, but uh, still he continues and continues uh, observing uh, secretly them and taking the pictures. And this is what happens. This is the main action in the book. And then something happens and it, uh, we, want, we don't want to give away too much because sure. it's I mean, may, may, <laughs> maybe, maybe, it is, maybe it is too cliche to say, every homophobe is actually gay, but, but maybe it's more accurate to say mm -hmm. that homophobia has its roots yeah. in, in, in a fear of a loss of masculinity and the way that the figure of the queer or the gay, I'm not sure what the Georgian word for faggot is, mm -hmm. that the fear of this person is a person who lies on his back, opens his legs and gives up his masculinity. Yeah, exactly. and, and the fear of that within oneself. And, and I mention that because you, you, you speak about how, how um, you're writing about a Georgia that is transforming and becoming a more egalitarian society. And, and you set your novel in 2012, but, uh, and, and from a little bit of Google research I was doing, I saw that, that 2012 was a year that, that the equivalent of a hate crimes um, act uh, became law in Georgia, which mm -hmm. which made homophobia an aggravating circumstance in yeah. a crime. So 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 queer people are are gaining new power as well in this Georgia. We do have good legislation. Uh, well, we are at least our uh, state is trying to catch up uh, because you know we are aspiring new country. Somehow we will hope some someday we will be accepted there and so on and so because of this international pressure mostly not because of the political will of the state uh, uh, so it's kind of uh, we are updating the laws but you mentioned that law that uh, um, hate crime is is considered to be an um, aggravating circumstance but uh, actually on uh, when it comes to actual cases it is very rarely applied in the courtrooms and very rarely i know like very few examples of this when it was uh, this law was applied, so uh, it still it still remains a huge problem. And so on the paper, oh, everything is okay, uh, and legislation wise, everything seems to be normal. Like I mean, we have maybe we have better legislation than many other countries, but it does not uh, it it does not equal to to its uh, actual to the uh, actual application of the laws. So uh, well, the situation is. Uh, actually changing yes uh, that there there is some progress but uh, with this progress and with more visibility as you know of course there comes a much bigger backlash in the society because uh, until you are quiet uh, you are living your own private little life so actually it's less a problem and um, as soon as, as it becomes a uh, public issue of public discussions. So the backlash is getting stronger. So we have, we have witnessed this in Georgia. Uh, in 2013, there was this huge uh, thing that happened, a very unfortunate thing, which happened on 17th of May, which is the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. And it was to be celebrated by a 
very small group of local activists. It was not even a huge celebration or some like, as we see the westernized pride or something in, in the bigger countries. Well, it was like a, a formal celebration in the main square of Tbilisi and it was attacked by a huge mob of people, uh, aggressive people, mostly men, uh, led by Georgian priests mm. and Orthodox Christian priests. And they had this huge campaign campaigning against uh, that we won't allow the, the propaganda of faggotry and so on and so So, I mean, um, well, I'm laughing now, but um, it, it was a near-death experience for many ex activities. Uh, were, were, you, were you part of that demonstration? No, I was not, but a lot of my friends were. And so uh, it, it was a scary and it was really an uh, unfortunate uh, thing that happened then. And since then, there is this, uh, the backlash uh, is not getting, uh, so it's getting stronger and stronger. From the so to say to be to put it mildly from the conservative part of the society to, to give it a cultured name i used to write some uh, stuff when i was much younger in 2005 and i would never ever dare to publish anything with, uh, in my with my real name so i used a pen name and then i remember those stories and those were short stories they were quite naive i would say today i would not uh, I'm, I'm thinking okay i'm i'm it's You're quite happy you used a pen name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should all use pen names for our, well, was, for our was, early I, literature. I, I was a beginner. So, but in 2005, um, uh, they, all the editors of the magazines, of literary magazines, knew me as a translator of American poetry mostly. And I worked, collaborated with them a lot. So they all knew me, but I would send them anonymously my stories. And uh, uh, either they got published and, and there was only one case that one, one thing was published, one small short uh, story about AIDS uh, and um, the rest were cancelled. They, uh, they were not banned, but no one wanted to publish them. And, and I would receive from some of them uh, very insulting comments about the text. So that, would, uh, that has changed definitely. Now well, here we are, and guys, here we are in Twitter. Guys, now all the same uh, uh, editors. Maybe they they have not changed themselves, but they know now that they cannot do that. They cannot. Well, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose that 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 begs a question. A question I want to ask you is: Is here you have a book uh, with um, with very much a, a, a gay situation, mm -hmm. a very explicit, um, and it's a bestseller in Georgia in 20, 2017, 2018? Yeah, 17, 18. Um, how was the book received? Were there homophobic responses? Was there backlash? And what surprised you about the way it was received? Yeah, yeah, it was quite surprising for me. Well, the, first of all, I would say, yes, the book is about these issues, but uh, because it is written from a different perspective, uh, so uh, that um, it is not so explicit about uh, in terms of sexuality. I mean, that there are not so, uh, I mean, there are no sex scenes. Actually, there are no sex scenes. And, and was, if I can just ask a question for a minute, we'll come back to my, yeah. my main question. Was that a decision that was in any way governed by your concerns about how it might be received in Georgia to decide not to write sex scenes? Or was it because it, it just didn't fit the um, yeah. the uh, the style of of, of the prose? And what God knows, I've tried really hard, but uh, then uh, <laughs> it was it was it is an artistic issue, so to say, uh -huh. with you because with my editor I had three large sex scenes, and right. together with her we decided, okay, I'm not ready as the writer for that. <laughs> because you didn't want to find yourself on that Guardian list of the of the yeah. the worst sex writing no, of the book. year no they were not well written i will i'm trying in the new book I, I will i promise i will have at least one but as for the rest as for the how how it was received uh, well it was surprising that i i still expected there would be some kind of backlash but there was not to my surprise well um maybe because uh, uh when we when we mentioned the word bestseller uh, for the western year so to say it, it sounds different but because of georgia's book market is quite small 
and a couple of thousand, uh, well, it, it sold more than a couple of thousand copies, but several thousand copies uh, sold in Georgia means the bestseller, which is a different thing from the, I don't know, from like, was not like Harry Potter bestseller, <laughs> was not <laughs> huge, first of all. Uh, it still means that this book went to the audience that are like the regular readers. It means, I mean, in, in this circle, in this literary circle, still, mm. uh, this is one thing. But the, another thing is that uh, I was thinking about it a lot while working about the book, um, because I don't want, I didn't want to write a book written by an activist, mm. so that it contains like blunt messages, which is what is good and what is bad. I do think that some things are good and some things are bad, but and that homophobia is a crime and it's a big problem. But I, I decided to treat this issue in more, a little bit slightly controversial way, uh, not to be very blatant about the message uh, and to uh, write this character uh, who is the main character, his perspective. And to uh, when I'm saying that he's a homophobe, like he's not a stereotypical, uh, devil with horns and uh, and the tail. Uh, I mean, not the incarnation of of evil, but he's a regular man, and that's what interests me most of all. Like to find uh, to talk about regular people who lead like normal lives, uh, and uh, nothing remarkable in their lives, and that's where. Uh, all this um, everyday evil is hidden, so to say. So I chose this and maybe that's why uh, um, the book is completely empty of the uh, authorial voice, so to say that there is no narrator, they are, uh, the omnipotent author who, who would give some descriptions of the characters. Well, well, more than that, to... you, you fragment, mm. you, 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 you fragment uh, subjectivity even further because each chapter I understand is told from a different perspective yeah so there are I would imagine there is a chapter told from the gay man himself yes and is that's a, a big surprise uh, because it is the very last chapter uh -huh. uh, and it's only half a page like uh, 100 words uh, or even less so that why that my... choice why that choice yes uh, because it was my um Again, I mean, very conscious decision because I had written much more, but in the final version, I cut everything and said, okay, so uh, this is again, uh, so uh, on one hand, it's quite explicit, but not really explicit choice uh, to write. I mean, there, there is no place for those voices in our life. And so this is how much you get your voice heard uh, as I mean, the book is, uh, more than 100 pages long and uh, the gay character who is the important character in the book gets only half a page and this is um, this somehow reflects the reality to my uh, to in my mind so. I, I know it's it's always a, a very difficult question to ask an, a novelist or a writer of fiction do you feel that those hundred words uh, come from your truest self in a way that um, the other however many 70 or 80,000 words don't. Do you feel that that is the sort of the key, the key to the soul of the novelist, those hundred words? Well, uh, first of all, I'd say that uh, while thinking about this novel and while processing it in my head and in my notebooks, because I would normally write for years in notebooks and then go to proper writing, uh, the only thing I knew for sure, the two only, two only, um, two things I knew for sure from the very beginning, like five years earlier before I started writing actually the book, was that I would have this ending uh, of the character, um, of this gay character, and I would have the title. What did you learn about yourself by having a fictional character observe a fictional avatar of yourself? But uh, instead, um, creating this fictitious character, Zurab, the protagonist, and uh, while working on him, uh, imagining him and creating him, I realized that I, I, I don't want to say that I became more, uh, uh, I mean, I don't hate this character, though he does terrible things. He's a bad person, so to say. Uh, 
and uh, he and he has the chance to be a good person in the book, but he never uses this. On mm -hmm. the contrary, uh, but still, I try to understand him because that's what I learned. So it's not enough to to state that okay, uh, a person who is a homophobe is a bad person, and we need to punish him or we need to do something. But maybe if we want to change something, we need to understand. It doesn't mean to justify what, what the person does or oh. thinks but sure. understand how the mechanism works. And so I know that I know that you are um, you, you did work much more as an activist um, mm -hmm. uh, earlier in your life and, and you don't work sort of full time as an activist now. No. Mm -hmm. but, but on the basis of your experience of having gone through this uh, in imagining Zurab, what could you say about what you think might be effective? in terms of LGBTQ activism going forward in a country like, like well, Georgia? Uh, well, it's a huge and very painful issue. Uh, well, we mentioned some facts that happened in 2013 and there were other facts and there still are, that there is still this uh, ongoing backlash and violence against activists. And it's quite a dangerous thing to be an activist in this country. Uh, and it's not just, I'm not just uh, saying it by, I mean, it's, uh, I have facts, actual mm. people's lives and who are risking mm. their lives. Uh, and uh, well, I, uh, I cannot call myself an activist compared to those, uh, those people who really actually risk their lives every day and actually work. So that's why I would not, it's too much uh, to, uh, to call myself an activist. So, and actually, I decided to quit activism uh, many years ago um, because you know it's so frustrating because you work every day you work every day you have to immediately respond to every challenge every new thing happening in your country and you have to do it every day and it's exhausting and it's challenging and it's uh, frustrating that you you fight you fight and it's a daily fight and you don't get the result even in, in a year or two or three the change is so small and not tangible. And uh, uh, then I decided, okay, and it was my very conscious decision that, okay, I need to quit now. I need to do something else in my life. And then I chose to go back to writing and go back to literature and study gender studies. I, I did an MA in gender studies and literature. And so go into that direction, go to theater and <clears throat> somehow try to, maybe this is, still a blue dream or a naive dream of every artist or writer or whoever works in cultural field that they can change something through their uh, work. But I, I'm, not that, um, I'm not that naive because, okay, I'm 38. It's uh, no age to be naive, but uh, um, still you have this very tiny little hope somewhere here in, in your heart or back of your brains or wherever it sits, that you still can influence people. And then I decided, okay, uh, I need to do that, to follow this path, maybe to work slowly you know, on a very long-term project. And maybe the impact of this work will be not so visible, but still I feel more comfortable doing this. But, but would you like to say anything at all about your the project of making fiction for you where it goes next addressing the issue of a um, small provincial provincial town where i myself come from from western georgia with that little seaside town with like only fifty thousand people living there an industrial town uh, and uh, the uh, brutality and uh, the, the violence among children there among boys so uh, the issue that is extremely important for me, and I hope that, well, it is important because it is widely discussed uh, in, in Georgian media and everywhere in Georgia right now. So uh, why do boys uh, in their closed uh, little communities in like sports communities or uh, some other school communities, uh, what is the origin of this violence in, the, in them? So, in a way, I'm continuing the same thing, uh, continuing the like, exploration of masculinity, but this time uh, at the level of its uh, birth, so to say, where it starts to um, shape 
to where, where it uh, <clears throat> gains the shape at, at the early teenage uh, uh, among early teenage boys and so i'm writing about this now so there's a very interesting recent documentary georgian documentary that looks at boys and masculinity right mm -hmm. um and I, I i i'm wondering how i forget the name of it but i'm thinking about that documentary i'm thinking about and then we danced mm -hmm. i'm thinking about your book and and um you know, you speak about backlash, but backlash is, is often in response to action and people claiming yes. agency, as you said, and people speaking. Um, and um, do you feel there's a sort of new Georgian movement? Uh, I, I'm not sure if you would call it a queer movement or a, or a gender conscious movement. Um, you know, there's also that, that extraordinary film, My Happy Family, um, about a woman who who walks out on the patriarchy. Yeah. Um, from, from the outside, something seems to be happening in Georgia. Um, how does it feel on the inside? And, and, and where are those other voices? And can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, definitely. It's good that you mentioned this wonderful film, which is one of my recent favorites from Georgian cinema. It's called My Happy Family by Nana. It's extraordinary. Yeah. female film director and she had an earlier one too about the girls uh, in bloom which is also a wonderful film uh, yes. so i would mention that it's good that you mentioned them uh the her because uh well first of all before we talk about the queer voices in georgian literature and culture in general we need to mention that it's women's voices that start that are very loud nowadays so you know before uh uh, um, early 2000s thought, I mean, that there were very few women in literature and in arts in general, while well, in, in cinema too and in theater. But this situation is changing now. Well, I, earlier in this conversation, I mentioned that the emancipatory movement, so to say, the emancipation, this trend of women's emancipation and women's voices becoming stronger. And you know, as uh, both in activism and in culture, in cultural life, these two things are very much linked and connected. So it starts, it all starts with women uh, all the time and with women's uh, strive and with, with women's fight for equality and to, for their voices to be heard. So these are brave and new, young and strong women who, who brought a change actually. And only after that, the queer movement starts to develop. So they are, the things are kind of connected because as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, that it's the fear, fear of the men is that they will lose their masculinity. So which equals to misogyny. So it's the, fear of becoming a woman. Uh, homophobia is misogyny. Yeah. Yeah, homophobia is completely like, uh, like identical. Well, they have the same roots, the same uh, mechanisms, I would say. So, and um, that's why these things are connected. And uh, if you uh, have a look at the uh, new Georgian writing nowadays, so uh, there are so many younger uh, women writers who started writing in early 2000s or just recently, and they are becoming more and more important in Georgian literary scene, and they cannot be ignored anymore. They were ignored. They've been ignored for more than a century in Georgian literature. and. <clears throat> And they are gaining more popularity, and they are like celebrities. They, uh, their books sell really well. So, and that, that's that's a very helpful thing. So, to to diversify this field somehow, that there there are diverse voices nowadays, and it's not like that. Uh, I am the kind of uh, only person writing about these issues. No, no, far from that. There are several authors that uh, there are like. Uh, trans issues, there are lesbian issues and characters in the literature and so many other uh, things happening and like uh, Georgian literature started talking about disabilities of racism and chauvinism and all these issues are boiling somehow. So it's uh, on the boiling temperature right now. And I would uh, just yesterday I finished uh, reading a wonderful book by uh, my favorite Georgian female writer. Well, in general, my favorite Georgian contemporary writer, Tamta Melashvili is her name. And the book is called 
uh, Blackbird, Blackbird, Blackberry. It's a wonderful book about a little town and a 48-year-old uh, woman who has an affair for the first time in her life, a sexual, uh, a lover. And it's a fantastic tale of, of a person living in the provincial town, taking care of her own reputation and um, uh, being a virgin for 48 years. And finally, she has this in her life and she's terribly scared. Uh, anyone will learn about this. And this is also, I mean, uh, this seems like a, a plot for a funny book, but the book is not funny at all. So this is still an issue. And why I mentioned this book, and uh, I could have mentioned many more, that uh, these are just recent trends in Georgian literature. But uh, when I mentioned that I was writing some stories under a pen name in 2005, and then it was the, it, back then it was a rarity, and it was like singular cases of people trying quietly writing something. But nowadays it's completely different. It's open and. I mean, I think as as we're as we're talking, I'm thinking about that one of the differences between between film and literature, um, and I'm thinking specifically about and then we danced and and my happy family, which are two films that that many people watching this would know well, is is that when when you're making a film, particularly when you're making a film, you know, with foreign funding that you know is going to be subtitled, um, you you are kind of playing in a global field you know that you're going to have an audience at Cannes. You know you're going to be picked up by Criterion, maybe Netflix. And in that global sort of online field, um, uh, there, there, is, there is freedom and exploration and possibility and, and, and queer or queer friendly or, 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 or feminist audiences. Uh, back home, it, it's, it's more difficult. And, and therefore, for writers who then need to get their books translated, their, their primary uh, audience would be, or readership would be a Georgian audience. And in a way that, I mean, you, you don't need to raise the kind of money Levan Akin needed to raise to do your work. But in yeah. terms of reception, your, 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 your job is harder because you write in Georgian. Um, and, and, and it raises an issue, I think, about the global and the local and about how, how what happens with queer identity, queer subjectivity, queer literature, queer art, how it shuttles between a kind of globalized modernist um, notion of rights and, and the realities of life on the ground in a city, in a small village, in a church, uh, in a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wonder what you think about that. Yeah, you're right, absolutely right. So I'm saying very often, I, I keep repeating this, that. Uh, when you are a writer in Georgia and you write in this language, this is your curse and your, <laughs> blessing, and your blessing too, because you know the language is really ancient and the literary tradition is huge, which means a lot. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, and you you have like a basis for for your writing in 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 your big history of literature. But at the same time, when uh, only 3.5 million people speak this language uh, and even less read it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, it's a big, it's a big issue. It's a big problem, of course. Maybe that that's, uh, I mean, it should be your, um, not just the native language you're writing in, but the native uh, environment as well. You need to be brought up here and uh, when you try to write about something else well unless you are I, I don't know Joseph Conrad maybe so if mm -hmm. you are Joseph Conrad you can do anything or Samuel Beckett or whatever. Well you went into a foreign country when you wrote a, when you wrote from the perspective of a homophobe I mean one oh. might argue that that is more of a foreign country than yes. a gay German man. Yeah yeah so that's you, 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 you have traveled across borders. Yeah. But what I uh, think is that I write for Georgian readers, the people who can read Georgian, first of all, and um, uh, though it makes it quite local, but then somehow, strangely enough, then it turns out to be uh, interesting for someone else too. Uh, you worked as a translator. I mean, I don't know if you still do, but you attained um, a national celebrity, age 22, translating Harry Potter, and you then went on to translate Shakespeare and Ibsen. So I'm interested to know how you how you thought then of your translating work, how you think of it now and how, how the work you did as a translator 
informs your work as a as a as a writer of fiction or drama? Well, funny thing is that when I enter the audience, I, I do teach also at the university and with kids uh, some creative writing and other stuff, drama theory. And I I start always introducing myself. So, how many of you have read Harry Potter? Well, it's the majority, of course. And how many of you have read it in Georgia and said, well, it's also the majority of the majority. I said, okay, kids, you were all brought up on my work. <laughs> so I was, uh, I only translated two books, second and the third one, and I was uh -huh. one. And I was the youngest uh, translator of Harry Potter. And then this Romanian girl appeared who was 19. And so I was beaten. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> seriously. Um, uh, I uh, or I keep translating nowadays because you know uh, you have to have a lot of side jobs in Georgia to survive. On on your writing, it is impossible. Well, pretty much the same about uh, everywhere. So it's anywhere, not, yeah. Writers need side jobs. Yes, unless I, they're J.K. J.K. Rowling doesn't need a side oh, job. Yes. Well, <laughs> unless you are J.K. Rowling, so you need it. So uh, and uh, I keep, still keep translating, but I only translated. Trans translate plays nowadays because I work at the theater as a dramaturg and I translate a lot of plays. So, uh, but not, not so much novels, but yeah, translating work is uh, very interesting. And especially as I have translated more than 35 plays so far, I mean, both classical and contemporary British ones, especially a lot of British playwrights. Um, uh, it's, it's very interesting for me because, you know, uh, uh, I translate the plays for theater and for the production, not for publishing. So uh, it means that uh, they need to sound proper uh, because it is so important for theater. So it's not like uh, you do the Google translation and like exact matching, every, it doesn't work like that. Well, uh, not in the novel either, but in the plays especially. So, and it, it teaches me, I mean, it, it gave me a huge experience of observing uh, the uh, characters who have the only means in plays, uh, only means of expression, it's a dialogue and talking mm. and talking, their voices. So maybe that's why when uh, some critics read my book and they said, okay, this is the you can tell that it is written by a theater man, by a man mm. who uh, wrote plays. So, and it is true, and I don't really mind it. I don't really. So this translation experience, uh, but sometimes I do, uh, I'm very often offered to translate like big books and big names too, uh, but I turn them down all the time because I say, uh, I, I feel a bit, uh, I don't know, um, sorry uh, when, when I translate a novel and it, it takes all your efforts and all your talent and you spend all your words on someone who is not you. So I don't know, I don't know. Maybe someday I would love to translate Margaret Atwood and not all her books are translated into Georgian and mm -hmm. because she is my uh, kind of soulmate, I love her. Uh, and one day I promise maybe if I will be offered uh, to translate one of her books, I will, I will say, okay, I, I'm going back to translating now because <laughs> she's the only one who deserves it. <laughs> Margaret Atwood, I hope you or your publishers are watching this. And yeah. um, if you need David's uh, contacts, we'll, we'll give them to you. Uh, David Cabrinio, this has been a really fantastic conversation. Very rich, uh, very, very lively and, and fascinating. It has just made me all the more interested in, in your own work in the new wave of Georgian literature in visiting your country where I have never been. Um, and I really look forward to being able to read your book in English. Um, for those of you who want to read an extract of David's book, uh, please go to wordswithoutborders.org where you'll see an extract. For those of you who want more information about this, this really wonderful initiative, uh, please go to georgesfantastictavern.com. That's one word georgiasfantastictavern.com. Thank you very much, David, and looking forward to your next novel too. My dog is saying goodbye to you as well, just on cue. Bye-bye. <laughs>